Dan, I know I've said this to you before, but I'm going to say it again. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yes. This Here we our, are in 2024. Yeah, this is our first podcast of the new year. Oh my, it's it's just exciting to be able to say that. You know, the haven't seen you since last year. Or this is the first time this year, first time all year that we've done a podcast. <laughs> yeah. If I haven't seen you for a year, that would be heartbreaking. So I'm glad that's not the case. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we are uh, going into the new year, but where are we at though, Dan? We should be getting close to our countdown to our 100th episode of all time. Yeah, I believe we have still, I think, five maybe or six to go. So we're, we're getting okay. close. How about after this episode, let's do a, an official count. And then like our next episode, let's start our countdown. Oh, okay. That sounds and good. And then we should also be really close to, to our 100th, 100,000th, slight difference there, 100,000th download. Yeah, we are approaching that as well. And that's major league in the world of podcasts. That's really cool. That is a major accomplishment. So I am uh, excited to be a part of the Woodhounds podcast and sitting next to my good friend, Dan. Yeah. And if all of you listening right now could share this with 1,000 of your friends, we would get there a lot quicker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you know 1,000 people? No, I don't know if I know 10 people. <laughs> and i don't know how many of those 10 i would even call my friend <laughs> yeah well start borrowing money off of people then you'll feel differently <laughs> i always worry when i go into town i might run into someone i owe money or i borrowed their <laughs> wheelbarrow and i haven't given it back yet <laughs> oh yep. yeah so you made it you made it through the holidays okay yep Made it through the holidays, wrapped up 2023 with a bang, and like I said, here we are in 2024. How much weight did you put on from Whew. eating all the holiday food? Too much. Yeah. Too much. I think you can put me on that same list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I'm not into uh, New Year's resolutions. Are you? Did you make any? Are you doing anything? I haven't made any yet, but I'm not, yeah, I don't really get into those either. It's, it's yeah. just, it's funny though, quick back to the whole weight thing. We bought these little um, confetti popper things for New Year's Eve. Yeah. And they had something where like you had to break this thing inside it and then it would like inflate and you would squeeze it and it would launch the confetti. Yeah. And on, on the label it said, inflate to celebrate. And I was like, that's been me all holiday season. <laughs> You call that December. Yeah. yeah. I've been inflating <laughs> since Christmas dinner. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 I had a, we had a nice holiday. We shared it. We have like, um, we have a very small family and we kind of all live in about a 10 mile radius around the lake here. So we got to hang out for that. We went to multiple houses for dinner and brunch <laughs> and, um, uh, I got some great nephew and great niece uh, that, you know, that are still uh, excited for the, uh, all the excitement around Christmas and all. So that was nice. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I, um, I don't make resolutions and it's funny because I am not making one for Ohio Woodburner, my firewood delivery service, but I am going to try and task myself with a focus. So mm. call it what you want. But the reason I say that was we got a couple of emails from listeners that um, love the Woodhounds podcast, and one of them kind of addresses the uh, the focus that I am trying to make with my production area wow. going into the new year. So Ooh. we got we had two emails, right? Uh, well, well, we got we, yeah, we got a we couple emails, emails from two people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, two was from the same person. Correct. Uh huh. So yeah, we had we had one email from Yosef who was out in Los Angeles, and, L.A. Yeah, out in L.A. And he was just wondering about I think the saw, like sawmill, if we had ever considered getting into uh, having a sawmill or anything in that industry, and 
and um i have not <laughs> yeah as as i i have not and that comes up a lot people always say you know i've had people when they were out at my open house that i had some really big oak logs they're like oh man those are too nice to cut up in the firewood you should make boards out of them and i was like nah i'm good <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i should take i i was at one point kind of thinking it'd be interesting but my a good friend of mine has a sawmill that i that i can use if i need to but it's uh -huh. yeah i get that they a look, lot too they look fun but i don't know it's just not for me i'm one of these people you know i just gotta want to have to do it and i'm not going to do it just you know for you know adding variety to my channel if i'm going to ever do it it's because i want to and i just don't and i just don't feel like it right now yeah same yeah. here mm -hmm. but don't let that discourage anyone from out there that that finds it interesting oh, yeah. you know yeah totally. go for it yeah and then we had a couple of emails from chris um chris liked us so much he sent us two that's right and he is up in alberta and he was wondering about what moisture meters we use and then he was also wondering uh what we do with all of the chaff, debris, sawdust, scraps, and everything that's left over from our daily operation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find this an interesting, two interesting questions. The second one is related to my focus, not a resolution, but a focus. But like the moisture meter, I started out with one. Um, it's kind of like with me, I, when I was uh, younger, I had a friend who was a city cop, and he had said that he could sit and do radar on cars going down the highway, and he had done it long enough that he could tell exactly how fast that car was going. And, you know, he always tested himself. He would, <laughs> yep. he would look at the car coming, guess the speed, and then look at the radar gun and see if he was right. And he says that he was very good, very good at it. And that's kind of like the way I am now with the moisture meter. I can just pretty much tell you what the moisture content's going to be. I need to test myself with that. But I, if I were to go find my moisture meter, I would probably have to look around for it <laughs> and <laughs> brush off the dust, you know? Uh, it's just the wood that I'm selling, you know, maple and cherry, when it's been stacked as long as it has been in my yard, you just know it's dry. Right. And is there a certain brand that you use do you, that you know of that you can recall? Yeah, it's called the cheapest. I got mine <laughs> at <laughs> I got mine at Harbor Freight. It was like $12.99. So, is it accurate? I don't know, but when I would test logs that I could just tell from my own observation, you know, that one had, was greener than the other. It, it seemed to make sense, you know? It, I mean, was it scientifically accurate? I don't know, but I think it was generally accurate. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am I'm. think the same thing. I think I have one from Menards that was the same, like 10, 12 bucks. And whether it's, you know, ac as accurate as others, I'm not sure, but I just kind of do the same. Can tell by the weight, can tell by the sound that you they make when you knock them together and, and Sooner, you know, at some point you just get to what you were saying. You kind of know. You just know. Yeah, I think so. You can just tell by looking at it. I'm sure you can get burned. There's a good pun for you uh, every now and then. And in my entire uh, firewood delivery career, I had one load that got rejected where I took, and this was very early in my, in my career. I thought the wood was dry and I delivered it and it was to a restaurant. It's very finicky very uh very high standards and it wouldn't burn for them now i took care of them uh, but you know ever since then i was even even more so paying attention to the moisture content of wood uh, but now just because of the way my system's set up i call it fifo that's a um, acronym used in food service it's called first in first out and that's how i set up my yard and that's how i i, I replenish the areas that I've delivered wood from when I stack the new in. So I just know what's next and I know that it's dry. 
Yeah. I, and, and we're, a bad, in, I we're will, a bad influence on people. Well, here, Dan. the one thing I will say that I have seen a lot of people use moisture meters and they use them wrong. <laughs> they stick them in the end of the log or at the yeah. end of the piece of wood that's not been, that's been sitting and they don't ever split the piece. Like you, to get a true reading, whether it's accurate or not, you need to split the piece open yes. and test the inside, not the yep. ends, right? Not, you know, not the side that's been split and exposed to the sun for three months. So that's, that's what I would give you for advice on as far as a brand or a model, just find one. doesn't matter. Amazon, yeah. big box store, but then learn how to use it if you want to use it. And that would be a way to cheat for people who are dishonest. You know, if you show up with a load of wood and you start jabbing your moisture meter into a stick of firewood and you go, look, it's only 12% moisture. And then you split it open and it's reading 35, you know, right. <laughs> the outside is because it's been exposed to the outside air and the sun, you know, for a while. Yeah. Uh, I had, you know, the area of my yard called Oakland and that's where, you know, I, my dislike of Oak just didn't happen overnight. <laughs> it, uh, it's earned its uh, place in my, uh, in the way I feel about it. I had Oak, I had, a tag on the post where I had it stacked. It was 18 months old <laughs> and I jabbed the moisture meter into it. It was reading like 20%. I split it open and it was still reading 40%. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So don't tell me that you can just, you know, and that's what they talk about sticking it in the end. I think the only time that that's reliable is if you, the log was just cut in half, you know, with a, with a chainsaw. Uh, that's reliable like that, but you know, you got to split the log open. It's got to be a fresh, a fresh area that's just been exposed to the outside air for the first time. Yeah. It's that, that whole, uh, Oak is, is really tricky. And then even like the standing dead trees, you'll always hear people say, well, this was standing dead or this was in log form laying on the pile for two years. Yeah. But you have to remember like the bark on a tree when it's living, its job is to keep the water in. <laughs> yeah. And when it's dead, the bark will do the same thing. So. Yeah. But what about, what about like a standing dead tree? And I'm sure that this is a testable hypothesis. And that's why I'm saying that we got to get a scientist on the Woodhounds podcast here. Cause I got a lot of these questions and I'm sure that the answer is already known, but I'm saying if it's a standing dead tree, no bark, like a standing dead elm or a dead ash has been standing for years dead. Don't you think that the water inside of that tree would start coming down towards the stump because of gravity over the years? So that the trunk, you know, near the base of the tree has got higher moisture content than, you know, the top or going out into the branches. Perhaps. Am I making sense? <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe some parts uh, like the higher parts of the tree or its branches have lower moisture content than when you get into the main stem and start going down towards the ground. So like the lower towards the ground, the higher the moisture content. I don't know. I'm sure that's a knowable uh, question. I just don't know what the answer is. Yeah. It's not yeah. knowable by me. <laughs> at this moment <laughs> uh, yeah that's why i'm saying we got to find a scientist out there that knows this kind of stuff yeah uh, okay so chris had a second question and it was again why don't you remind us all it was about the the mess yes he was wondering um what we do with the chaff debris sawdust slash trash etc that's left over from splitting and processing firewood yeah so that is, um, this is Wednesday, <laughs> first week of January. And that is really the same topic of my video that I'm putting out on this same day. And, um, up until this point, well, I guess it still technically is. My answer is, I don't know what the answer is. And I've just been dumping mine into a pile and I, 
I've challenged myself because I cannot keep this going because the pile's getting too big. When I first moved into my wood yard, you know, processor makes waste, a log splitter makes waste, sawdust and the like. I just found it too easy just to dump it on the ground. <laughs> and that worked out great now, but the pile's getting too big. I can't avoid it anymore. I need to do something about all my, all my chafe and slash and kindling and, and saw chips and, and the like. And I, um, I, I can't ignore it anymore, <laughs> but I still don't know what the answer is. Part of it is, is because I'm probably just, I just still can't get myself to address it because I think I can sell a lot of it. You know, you can sell the sawdust. Don't you think sawdust has got a market to it? I think there is. I think there's a market for that and the kindling and some of the bigger slash pieces perhaps, or even some of the small stuff from maybe like mulch. Yeah. I don't know. Dump into a garden or something. That's what I do with mine is everything is returned to the earth as mulch when I dump it in my ditch. <laughs> yeah. So in my video, I make a comment and I hated now that I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, I wish I wouldn't have said this <laughs> because it puts too much pressure on me. Um, you know, I said that if I see myself as a world-class firewood company, an exceptional company, I think I need to be zero waste. And I'm the opposite of zero waste right now. And I need to fix that problem. I'm as bound as opposite of waste as you can get, you know, plus the perfect split system on my processor on the APA, it makes a lot of waste. So I got a lot, man. And, um, I s harvest some of it for kindling, but it's just a minuscule amount compared to the whole pile. Right. Yeah. So I think that's gotta be my challenge and I need to get this figured out. Uh, you know, my, my goal is being a zero waste firewood uh, delivery service. Well, I I've seen a lot of people who will have like a burn barrel or like a burn pit that they, yeah. as they clean up, they just put it in you know, every day. They're like, add a little bit, have a little fire. And I've been doing that recently. When I go back to the wood yard, I'll just start a little fire in my warm bond, smokeless p fire pit. And I'll just, <laughs> I'll just add in some scraps every, you know, 15, 20 minutes and it, it cleans it up. But I think at some point, everyone always looks at like the kindling and the slash and they say, oh, there's, there's, you know, you should, you should pick that up and you should sell it. But then again, for me, it takes way too much time to sort through it all to maybe make, you know, a few dollars. I'm, I'm yeah. So the fire thing, uh, I got a couple opinions about that. Number one, that's a concern of mine. I don't, you know, fire in a firewood production area is problematic. <laughs> <laughs> and Controlled I see, <laughs> yeah, well, I see a lot of places, you know, I got a number of people I buy firewood off of and they have a big scrap pile. Now they live out in the woods, you know, and they're surrounded by a lot of grass and stuff. So the chances of like a, of a forest fire are low. Um, but you know, where I'm at is kind of a tight yard and I just don't like the thought of there being a fire and a, an, an ember flying off somewhere and landing somewhere and starting a fire when I'm not there. Um, the second thing is I am within city limits and I probably am not even allowed to have an open fire like that. No. I think having like a 55 gallon drum for heat, you know, that I, I could see something like that, but then again, I'm back to where I don't want to have a fire around my, my livelihood. I don't know. I don't even like people smoking um, you know, in my place. Yeah. I had a, I had a friend <laughs> who brought a friend that I uh, gave some wood. Well, he bought it from me. <laughs> when I say give, that means I didn't give it to him, <laughs> <laughs> but I went down to where they were and there was a cigarette butt right in the ground, right where they loaded it all into their truck, you know, and that's, gosh, that's just, that annoys me. And, um, it's, and I think, you know, that's, there's a risk I could have caught on fire. Yeah, that would be a, a major concern, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, because the other thing too is you would probably have to then make sure like that fire is completely out before you left for the day and you wouldn't want anything smoldering around. You know, so yeah, it probably would be for me. Yeah. It's, you know, it's usually out when I'm done anyway. I don't, I don't have that yeah. big of a fire going, but. So then the other thing is selling it. And I think um, the way my, 
mess is harvested because I got three different containers because of the way my 405 has that uh, cleaning system on it. And I have that big disc cleaner. And then I have another container that the sawdust goes into. So I have like three different levels of, of slash. I got like kindling and I have like a mulchy kind of a mess and I got sawdust. And this is where I just can't get myself to do it because it's not like I'm lazy. It's just I got so much other stuff that I'm doing. And I need to set those containers out with a for sale sign on them, you know, and, um, and try to become more aggressive in selling that stuff. Because I would think like organic farmers would want the, the mulchy kind of stuff, you know, uh, probably uh, outdoor uh, smokers or something would like the the bigger pieces and then like farmers or chicken uh people raising chickens would like the sawdust yeah for bedding or something yeah uh-huh so uh, that's just something that i'm missing and then the last thing is because i've looked into these pellets i thought wow man i could make like pellets with this stuff uh, but i'm just not i don't have the infrastructure for it i think you need a roof because you got to keep everything dry and um, all of your, your mess goes into a grinder and all those grinders that I have seen are not PTO power. They're three phase electric, which I don't have. And it's just, it's, it would just be, it would, the only way I would ever have that would be just something as like a pellet hobbyist no. where, I, <laughs> where I would just make a few, you know, for myself. Um, I don't know if I could ever have a setup to where you know you could make an industrial amount of pellets for sale so are you talking about like the little the little wood capsule things or like the bricks of like sawdust that's compressed together? uh no the little things look like fish food you know uh, okay yep yeah i've i looked into those pretty good and they're really they're they look yeah it looks like fun <laughs> um but you know the thing is they got to be kept the the grindings everything's got to be kept dry and there's like a dryer, you know, that blows air into them. So I would need a pretty healthy roof. I would need electricity. Um, and I would need a place to store all this stuff, you know. And that's what I'm saying. Everything's possible. But, you know, I, I want to go in a direction that makes sense. And uh, that would just be too much of a diversion away from my core business. So so the grinder takes would take like your sawdust and your scraps, everything, grind it into whatever. Pulverizes it. Yeah. Pulverizes it and then presses it into a pellet. Yeah, so the, it gets pressed through, it gets shoved through these little holes, and that's what makes, and like, you know, the fibrous stuff inside the wood, uh, because it gets so hot when it gets shoved through those holes, it kind of liquefies and then it dries, and that's why it stays in that little pellet. Huh. interesting. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you got to keep it dry. You got to have that grinder. That grinder's got to really pulverize that stuff down so that it can get into the mill and get it shoved through those little holes. And then you'd have to bag it and store it. Yes. And, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It, would, uh, it would require, like you said, some infrastructure in place to do that. Yes. And, uh, you know, and bandwidth, you know, bandwidth. <laughs> that's what, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, I can't even, I can't even address the pile in question <laughs> right now, <laughs> let alone do something about it. So that's, that's my position. Yeah. So Chris, you're asking the wrong guy. Okay. For what should, <laughs> what do we do with all this mess? Um, I, my policy has been, I will deal with it when I have to, and I'm getting close. And okay. and I just the the small stuff I have a spot that I'm filling in, so I I dump everything in one area a low spot and each year the stuff that I put in last year breaks down and decomposes a little bit more so I'm constantly adding to that and then the bigger slash I save for my fire pit uh, and burn there. Oh wow! All right, I think I'm probably in a bad spot with this because you know like these bigger operations they'll hire or rent the grinding service they'll come in with one of those big tub grinders oh yeah and yep. make a mountain of mulch out of all that stuff but you know i'm too small to make that worth anyone's time or my own uh, but i'm too big to just let it lay on the ground 
It's adding so. up. <laughs> well, and you know, I have always felt that I'm kind of in uncharted territory because there's not a lot of firewood services out there like mine. Um, you know, what I would call value added firewood, where I can be a sole proprietor and live a, a, um, a re financially responsible lifestyle of being a sole proprietor selling firewood. So there's probably not a lot of people out there in my predicament. So maybe that's what I'm saying too. I need to solve this problem on my own. And as I build this model, uh, I need to show that you just can't let this waste become a big pile and you got to be more aggressive with how you are uh, processing it, which to me would be selling it in some capacity. Right. And now you're, you're behind the eight ball. You gotta, you gotta catch up because you've got a large amount of it sitting there waiting for you yes. to deal with. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not, and that pile's not even one year old, you know, cause I didn't start producing until oh, May right. of last year. So I'm not even 12 months. We're, Ooh. we're uh, three quarters <laughs> of a year and I've already got this much waste, uh, there. I think the easiest stuff for me to have gotten rid of, even if I just gave it away, would have been the sawdust. Um, you know, and that's where I have this resistance to Facebook and the Facebook marketplace. And, um, I just, I just can't even get myself to like put an ad on there, free sawdust, you know, or, or, you know, sawdust for 20 bucks, you, you shovel kind of a thing. So now have you, have you kept it all separated or have you mixed it all together? <laughs> it's all, no, it's, it is one big unmanaged oh. pile. <laughs> so you're going to have to yep. deal with that. And then if you find a way or you find a, a source to get rid of it going forward, you might have to keep it separated, like keep the sawdust separated from the kindling yeah. and yeah. Yeah. I, and I could probably do that. Um, yeah. And that's what this is all. Every problem has a solution. And until I decide that I'm going to address it, you know, it's still going to lay there in that pile, unfortunately. Well, you could going forward, you could just keep, revolving ibc totes and fill one up with sawdust set it out right fill the next one up but then you might end up with a whole bunch from sitting out for sale next to the next to the road if nobody comes and yeah. gets them <laughs> <laughs> and then i'll need my tote because i've run out yeah. <laughs> so i'll just dump it on the ground anyways <laughs> yeah it's it's an interesting topic mm -hmm. and one that uh i think everyone probably has their own little way to deal with so, yeah well, if I could answer, uh, officially answer Chris's question, Chris, the answer is do the opposite of me. <laughs> Find a way to deal with it from day one and yeah. keep doing it. Right. Well, that was really cool, though. We got emails. Uh, let's just know that people are listening to us. And if other people out there, Dan, want to send us an email, how could they do it? They could email us at thewoodhounds at gmail.com. Yeah, and then maybe we'll read it on the air. And thanks again for, for sending that in, Chris. And and hopefully we, we answered your question um, to your liking. Yeah. All right. Well, Dan, this is really nice. So, okay, let's figure this out. We're heading into 2024, full speed ahead. We are, No, we're and in it. We're in it. We're in twenty. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we're we're in twenty four. <laughs> we're heading into it. <laughs> we're like in the tunnel, so we're heading into the tunnel, and uh, we are going to start this countdown for our one hundredth episode. And maybe me and you can come up with something fun that we can do for that episode when we get to it. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll get our gears turning here. Yeah. And maybe we'll, uh, we can, if we can get a couple more views too, let's, um, try to get that 100,000th download on the same episode. That would be Ooh, really cool. That would really yeah. be, yeah, that'd be awesome. And our listeners can help us out. If you could, uh, whatever your streaming service that you're listening to, if you could copy the URL and send it to a friend and encourage them to rate us, especially if you're listening to us on Spotify or any of these other, or Pandora that have the rating systems on there, uh, please uh, give us a five stars. And that really does help us out a lot too. 
Yes, indeed. And you can find us on all podcasting platforms every Wednesday morning at 5 a.m. And our website. Thewoodhounds.com. Yeah. All right. So, Dan, what do you say? Let's um, strike up the band. And let's get ready to uh, hammer into uh, 2024. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm off and rolling, man. Ready to go. (laughs) All right, so I want to thank all you out there for making the Woodhounds the number one firewood podcast in the world. Yeah, and we want to tell everyone out there to stay safe and be cool and have a great day.